and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be discussing the 1927 great silent religious epic film, The King of Kings, directed by Cecil B. DeMille as part of the Maybe Midrash Regathon, which is hosted by Jason at Old Blues Chapter and Verse, one of the prompts is to watch a religious film. Now I've seen this about five or six times prior, but I wanted to watch it again for the readathon, and I just watched it last night, so it would be extremely fresh in my memory. This is going to be largely based on a blog post, which I wrote in 2017, but I'll be fleshing out with some of my own thoughts along the way. So anyway, let's just get down with it. Released April 19, 1927, The King of Kings is one of Cecil B. DeMille's great biblical epics. While he was a devout Christian, he also loved his decadence and brought the two together in some very interesting ways. How many other directors would impart moral lessons alongside orgies, pet leopards, and parties where everything is made of candy? Something I found out when I went to a Cecil B. DeMille film festival when I still live back home in Albany, New York. This guy had a serious foot fetish, so he used his feet in some very interesting ways in his films, but I didn't particularly notice any special use of feet in this film. Maybe he just thought that was a little bit, you know, shouldn't be handled in such a holy religious film, but anyway. The immense cast includes H.B. Warner as Jesus, Dorothy Cummings as Mary, the awesome character actor Ernest Torrance as Peter, who is one of my favorite characters in this film, Jacqueline Logan as Mary Magdalene, Joseph Schildkraut as Judas, who is absolutely my favorite character in the entire film. I'll discuss that later. Child actor Mickey Moore as Mark, who is the last surviving cast member for obvious reasons because he was so young. He passed in 2013. Victor Varconi as Pontius Pilate in an uncredited Ayn Rand. When it comes to such a well-known story, an original angle is key. It helps the story to stand out from all the other versions. DeMille did this quite well, not only in his trademark decadent touches, but also in how he handed the religious material. And off of the top of my head, other silent films I can think of which deal with the Jesus story are um, Leaves from Satan's Book, a 1919 Scandinavian, I believe, film I don't remember if it's um, Swedish or Danish, and the um, D.W. Griffith, the um, great epic from 1916, Intolerance, there's a Judean storyline, and both of those films, those are anthology films, it's not the entire film, and they're just, you know, kind of, like, boring for me or just kind of there because they don't really do anything different or original with material obviously you're not going to change the material when it's such a well-known story and drawn right from the bible but you can at least do like different things to kind of draw out certain things in the background or like magnify a certain character and make that important part of the plot or just do you know something new and detailed and original is just something really interesting so your story is different from all the others and just makes it a lot better Mary Magdalene is at a very hedonistic party, which is in beautiful two-strip technicolor, which includes a pet monkey and leopard. And there's a really funny scene. This one dude is kind of checking himself out in the mirror and grooming himself, and he's really surprised, and the little pet monkey appears, and, oh, that's this little guy sitting on my shoulder. When one of her boy toys sits in Judas's chair, she pushes him out. This guy points out that Judas hasn't come around for a few days, and Mary Magdalene thinks Judas must be with another woman, and she, like, demands this guy give up the name of this woman he dares to cheat on her with. Upon being told he's hanging out with a band of beggars, led by a carpenter, she hops on her zebra-drawn chariot, because why not, and goes to find him. We then shift to a large crowd outside of Jesus' house, as people wait in line to get healed. One of the crowd is a little blind girl, who gives one of the film's most touching performances, like, you can really sense that she's pretending to be blind. It doesn't even really seem like acting. She's, you know, like, feeling her way around and, like, you know, touching a horse's tail and, like, just going around trying to find people who can help to lead her to Jesus. It's just, you know, such a wonderful, beautiful performance, even if she's only in there for one short scene. The future gospel writer Mark runs across her and takes her to a window. Mark said he was healed of his lame legs, and he's also one of the film's standout performances. I mean, a lot of child actors are kind of annoying, but I thought he was pretty good in the role. Our first sight of Jesus is through her eyes, and also a very touching Mary, like, sees a little girl by the window, and she, like, lifts her up through the windowsill when she realizes she's blind and needs some extra help. Shortly after this healing, Mary Magdalene arrives to confront Judas, whose ulterior motive in befriending Jesus is the possibility of being promoted to a high official. Before she can have it out with Judas, however, Jesus casts the seven deadly sins out of her in a multiple exposure sequence. And this is also very good. People are doing amazing things with film in this era, although a lot of people like to dismiss our ancestors in like pre-modern films because, oh no, there's no CGI. Those special effects must be automatic garbage. No, they were pretty advanced for the era, and even today they seem still seem really, really good. 
It's fair to assume just about everyone is familiar with the biblical account of Jesus' ministry and life. So the rest of this review will focus on my own thoughts and the things which make this film unique. And I should also mention, as a Jewish viewer, there are a couple of things here and there that do kind of make me uncomfortable. Like, for example, the long perpetuated historical misinformation about the Pharisees being bad guys and the complete misinformation that there's anything in Judaism prohibiting healing or saving a life on the Sabbath, but that's kind of beyond the purview of this review. That's like a whole complicated, detailed subject for a whole other topic. Some people feel H.B. Warner, in his early 50s, was far too old to play a convincing Jesus, though others feel his fatherly appearance is perfect for the role. It all depends on your perspective, though I do have to admit there were times as obviously like older appearance is kind of distracting because like Jesus was like a guy in his early 30s, and it's particularly noticeable with his scenes with Mary. Um, H.B. Warner was born in um, 1876, and Dorothy Cummings was born in 1894, so like really do the math. He's like older than the woman who's supposed to be his mother. The birth years should have been flipped. You know, that's kind of like silly. I absolutely love Ernest Torrance as Peter. He usually played heavies, which was um, old-fashioned slang for villains. So this is quite a delightful departure from his usual forte, and probably the, his most famous role is um, the father in um, Buster Keaton's 1928 film Steamboat Bill Jr. His Peter is just such a big, sweet lug, just perfect for the role. And there's also one moment I noticed when I was rewatching it last night. I don't remember if I had taken notice of it before when at the Last Supper Jesus is passing around the cup of the wine he says represents his blood. You know, Peter just hugs the goblet to himself and there's such emotion in his face. Just so many moments throughout the film he's, you know, not being a heavy like usual. He's just like a totally big, sweet guy. And in the image you're seeing, Ernest Torrance is the one on the far right in the group embrace. I also love the scenes of Jesus with children. Besides the blind girl, another sweet, lovely scene is with the child who tells Jesus Mark says he can heal broken legs. He gnaws. And then she presents a doll whose leg has fallen off. Jesus obligingly mends it all. That scene just really makes me smile. This like really cute little girl, maybe four or five years old with like, you know, dark curly hair. That's just, you know, such a believable little kid thing to do. And even grown-ups who just love their dolls and stuffed animals, many of them send them to like a a doll or stuffed animal hospital or an antiques restoration thing like on um, the repair shop if you're familiar with that British show it's, you know or anyone who just has a soft spot for their dear old friends. Almost all of the intertitles are from the Bible with the book chapter and verse noted although Cecil B. DeMille does occasionally do things entirely of his own imagination like obviously the opening scene by the wild party and sometimes here and there throughout the film. They're also rendered in Elizabethan English, which can be kind of distracting to the average modern audience, or at least if you're like under the age of 80. These people spoke Aramaic, not any form of English. I tend to tra mentally translate Elizabethan English in my head because, you know, obviously I don't have a really a problem reading Shakespeare or other writers who actually wrote in Elizabethan English, but it's just kind of like annoying and pretentious when you're doing it with a language that was not, had it had equivalent pronouns and Grimm, and I'm so glad that style has fallen by the wayside. And you're seeing an image from the famous scene where a woman is accused of adultery, and Jesus famously challenges the crowd, let he who is among you without sin cast the first stone. And all these people are starting to get guilty consciences and drop the stones and, like, walk off their, their own accord, but, you know, a few of them are still, like, hoping maybe they can stone her. And so he starts writing in the sand in Hebrew, like, various sins and they're revealed in English as the sin these like guys are guilty of and they you know drop the stones and they go away and oh by the way the sand had spilled out of a broken jug and then the mob continues scattering as their sins are revealed until the final guy left thanks God he's not like other men and then his sin is revealed as adultery and he too leaves in a scene in the 155 minute grand premiere version versus the 112 minute general release Jesus steps into the carpentry shop of a couple whose son he just cast the devil out of. And originally, Judas had tried to heal the child on his own, saying, Oh, don't trouble my master. We can do it perfectly fine ourselves. And he's unable to heal the child. And so Jesus has to come up and heal the boy himself. And Judas is told, like, you, you could have done it, dude, but you just didn't have enough faith. And then he sends some of his disciples into the water to go fishing for, like, a fish with a gold coin in it because some tax collectors are also passing them. And Peter gets the a fish with a gold coin and he's so delighted and the tax collectors think this is totally awesome too so they get into a boat and start fishing themselves it's just a really like really fun scene in the film and the piece of wood by the way in the, in the carpentry 
shop Jesus is working on is covered on top by a cloth and he's kind of like really getting into it like you know sanding it down because he's a carpenter he's in his element and then when the cloth is pulled off it's revealed to be a cross you can just see the look on his face and then carpenter himself is saying oh I make lots of crosses for the Romans they pay me really well Joseph Schildkraut who is um, born in Austria is excellent as Judas his body language conveys how conflicted and torn up he is about his betrayal. Like, he didn't start out as a bad guy at all. He's not never really depicted as a bad guy at all. Obviously, he had the misguided motivations, but he wasn't doing it to be, like, you know, nefarious and purposely betray his body. It's just, you know, it, when Jesus um, refuses the crown Judas wanted to put on him, he you know, just panics and, like, feels, like, such bitterness and he just basically like goes and betrays him and you can see on his face even while he's getting the silver he's like really regretting this and like throughout the rest of the film like why did I do this I was such a horrible person I can't believe this is happening to my one of my buddies because of what I did and it just you know totally tortures him and he's totally heartbroken about it so you know it's a very very complex nuanced performance and since you know a lot of people think oh people all overacted in the silent era no he said so much with his body language and his eyes and his facial expressions way more than you can say with words sometimes you know so this is one of the many reasons i absolutely love silent films a dove flies onto the empty last supper table which was apparently unplanned and the resurrection scene which is the penultimate scene of the film is also in two strip technicolor but it didn't really appear that vibrant i don't know if that's just because they didn't restore that part of the film like as well as they could have or maybe it was beyond like complete Restoration, because I have seen beautiful, you know, before and after versions of old two-strip and three-strip Technicolor, or maybe it's just because it was, like, more monochromatic. It's, you know, outside, mostly, you know, rocks and birds and grass and stuff. It's not, you know, like, super-duper vibrant, bright, vivid colors like it was in the wild party scene in the opening. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, Cecil B. DeMille was a devout Christian, so obviously he did his utmost to make the film as, you know, biblically accurate and sensitive as possible but unfortunately a few people still complain you know what else is new like what film or book or album or song has ever like succeeded in not offending a single person I don't know why these people complain maybe it was because he did you know kind of put some things in different order than in the bible like he puts like scenes that happened in a certain place in a different place or an event that happened much earlier much later and vice versa but on the whole I think he did a really really good job it's a very beautiful well done emotional film although obviously there are some issues like for example a dude in his early 50s kind of doesn't really look realistic as Jesus particularly when you consider the woman playing his mother is young enough to be his daughter but other than that like everything is just so good and uh, both versions are good definitely but the longer original just adds so much extra depth makes it seem like the general release is mi missing lots of chapters I highly recommend this film to people of all faiths, and even though I'm obviously not the intended audience because I'm Jewish, I did appreciate it in its own way. So thank you very much for listening to the end. In the future, I might do some more videos about silent films and films from the early sound era, particularly ones which are based on books like, for example, I would love to do some videos about Vicente Blasco Ibanez's um, great epic anti war novel, The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. The original film version from 1921 stars my favorite actor, Rudolph Valentino, and just many other films I would like to do also in future. So if you haven't subscribed already, please consider doing so. And I also do love to see um, comments from my viewers and just getting to know who my audience is and becoming virtual friends with all you guys. And so I'll um, see you again very soon. Thanks. Bye.